I returned yesterday from Indonesia and I have on my Indonesian shirt. Doesn't it look a lot like a Robert Graham shirt? I love the shirt. It was a gift to me by the people who hosted me um, for um, my time in Indonesia, a, a country of what is it, about 17,000 islands. Can you believe it? In our Chipilago, there's a whole country, 17,000 islands. I live in a county, San Juan County, that has about 700 islands. That's High tide, low tide, I mean low tide, about 450 islands high tide. So be careful what islands you're on, depending on what time of day. But it's good to be home, and, uh, and I, all of a sudden, I look at the lectionary passages for today, and one is the story behind the Christmas story. You got that right. There is a story, a biblical story, behind the Christmas story. This is the story that most people know in the Bible, but they don't know it. it's from the Bible or that it's even a, a Bible-based story. This is maybe the best-known Bible story in the world, but people don't know it as a Bible story because this is the story behind literally the Christmas story. Charles Dickens read a story that Jesus told and he was totally transfixed by that story, just almost paralyzed by it. He couldn't get his head out of it. There was, there was so much there. But what gnawed at him was he did not like the ending. And what, the thing that bothered him most about the ending is, what if the story had ended differently? What if Jesus had a different ending to the story? And so he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ignore Jesus's ending. I'm going to give it a whole different ending. And what we have as a result is probably one of the best known stories in the world, which is a Christmas story. But it's based on a Bible story that is our lectionary passage, one of our lectionary, the gospel lectionary passage for the week. It's the story of Dives and Lazarus. I don't, you know, if you've been a part of this journey with me on uh, these, these semiotic uh, readings and, and, and treatments of the scripture, I don't like to look at the Bible, the books of the Bible, the letters of the Bible, as a literary text. Um, there are some benefits that come out, out of that, but the Bible is not meant to be read as a text. It was meant to be heard in a crowd, uh, in a community, orally. And many people that were hearing it first couldn't read or write. So we turned something that was meant for oral reading and community into silent reading in, in private. And that's what the, the text approach does, is to is kind of foster that silent reading of a, of a text rather than an oral reading of a story in community. But as we look at this today, this passage of Dives and Lazarus, we're going to look at it in almost forensic detail. Almost, it's called, I call it granular semiotics because we're, I'm just going to go word for word through the story. Paying attention not just to what is there, but what is it isn't there. The storyteller moves the story along and the plot by not just what is there and is told, but what isn't there, the, the silences, the spaces. I have a student, a doctoral student now, uh, David. He, he talks about the selahs, and I love that, the selahs of the story. So we've got to pay attention to what is there, what isn't there. There are certain things that we need to know, though, and I thank God for higher criticism because they have taught us to take these kinds of things seriously. So before we, we get into this passage... Um, we need to know this is the only story Jesus told where he gave a character a name. He told a lot of stories about people, um, and but this is the only one where he gave one of the characters, one of those people characters, a name. And there are other characters in here, but they're not named. But the war, there's one person that is named. So this is... This is called technically a half pax legomenon, one of a kind in the, in the genre. And in the genre of Jesus storytelling, 
the only person that he gave a name of a, a an actual name to is in this story. Now, the, the name he gave, of course, you all know, is Lazarus. Lazarus is the beggar. He doesn't give a name to the rich guy. Dives just means rich guy, okay? But he gives a name to the beggar, Lazarus. And so it's the only character he names. Now, wait a minute, who's Lazarus? Why would he name him Lazarus? Well, Lazarus is his best friend. He basically has three best friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and hangs out with them all the time at Bethany. But this is the only care, and it, so it is semiotically significant. And we don't know why, but we just got to kind of suspend it right here. We're not going to be able to understand the story as Jesus wanted us to, unless we come to the terms with the fact that this is the only story he gave a character a name to, and he named it the character after his best friend, and he named his, the character after a best friend, the character was a beggar poor and had leprosy. So the lowest gets the name, the highest gets no name. And remember, nomen est omen. That, uh, that's an old Latin expression. That the name is an omen. Uh, nomen est is omen. Uh, German. So this is our prep work for actually understanding the story and putting it in its in its proper setting. Now we're going to read it literally word for word together, all right? So turn with me to Luke the 16th chapter and beginning at verse 19. The story of Lazarus and Dives. I remember every little detail is chosen carefully by a storyteller because the details drive the story. When you're reading it to get points, you can skip over the details. But when you're reading it for the story and for the importance and meaning of the story, then details matter. God is in the details, somebody once said a long time ago. Devil's in the details too, but that's a whole other story. So... Here we go. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. All right. There was, so what do we know about this rich man? Whoa, do we know a lot. And, and this is, this is, so Jesus is setting up here, all right, almost setting us up to identify the people who heard him. When they heard this, they would have come up with a name, because there's so few that, had, that covered all these characteristics. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple. Okay, first of all, who dresses in purple? Who can afford purple? Who has purple? Well, basically, not many. You got kings, you got priests, especially high priests, and you got the uber-rich. Right? So you got three different categories there. So people, when they heard this, was a rich man um, who was dressed in purple, would have been one of those three. Right? So we're, this is a story about king, a story about high priest, this is a story about the uber rich. Immediately, people hearing this would have had some names in mind. Dressed in purple and fine linen. All right, so just didn't dress in purple, but uh, just clothed the, this whole abode and his body with fine linen. Wait a minute. And lived in luxury every day. All right, now that's, a, that's an important detail. Because when I'm listen, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about people like, you know, who would you think about? The uber rich that can afford anything and love to... Love to, um, but some people can afford it, and they don't. They don't do this conspicuous consumption thing. They don't showcase their riches. But this is somebody who dressed their wealth, dressed in their wealth, surrounded themselves, the fine linen, uh, surrounded themselves with their wealth in their home, and lived in luxury every day. Now, when I first thought of this, I thought of the richest people in the world. All right. 
Um, and, you know, you begin to think of names. Um, but one name that you quickly cancel out was Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. It, this is not a story about Warren Buffett. Because he lived in luxury every day. <laughs> no. Um, no. Um, Buffett is just saving his money. Uh, he's saving it for this trust that he's going to leave. Um, he lives very parsimoniously, um, very discreetly. He's basically a tightwad, and he spent. His daughter came to him and said, "Dad, I need help for a kitchen. Please help me with my kitchen. I, I, I can't afford to help him. So I can't afford to buy all the things that I want. And if you check kitchen appliances out, you know what she's talking about. And so he he wrote a check for thirty thousand. <laughs> he got. He could, she could have, could you, you know, have you priced appliances recently, Warren? I mean, you basically doomed your daughter to a uh, third rate kitchen with 30, um, most of you, some of you listening to this have more expensive kit than, than Warren Buffett wanted to give his daughter. So <laughs> this is not a Warren Buffett story, but people in Jesus' day, because Jesus is, is so detailed and and giving exactly the attributes and characteristics of this rich person who goes on name, that um, they would have come up with a name. They would have come up with a name. And all of you right now, I know, are thinking about, I, I think this could be a, or a story about this person. Or this could be a story about this person. The richest people in the, in the culture that you know. Now, at his gate. Okay, can you imagine the gate? What that look like? What kind of a gate was it? See, you got to, again, when you're reading the scriptures, translating them into the context of our day, they've got to become cinematic. It's got to be a motion picture in your mind. you got to see it. So see this rich person's gate. What kind of a gate was it? Well, it's probably a huge gate. Now, gates are meant to keep people out. And um, there's usually security at gates. And so this is a huge gate. Um, I, I just did a little kind of Google search of various stars and celebrities gates and um, went to Michael Jordan's gate, big 23 in the gate. I love that. Just so you, you hardly see the gate. You see the big numbers, 23. Well, you know who lives there immediately, but at any rate, um, at his gate, this is the ornate, beautiful, um, intricate, maybe gold-studded gate, was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, if you really understand the culture of the first century, and you're reading this, you go, that can't be. That makes no sense. If this is, if you're not reading, the, if you're reading the Bible and not getting the sense of, that makes no sense, that can't be, you're not reading it right because Jesus flips everything upside down. And what is normal and routine, suddenly for Jesus, is uncommon. And, and what is uncommon becomes common. So if you're not having this almost anxiety attack about this can't be right, the way I'm reading this story, because this, not, this doesn't happen like this. If you're not having that, you're not reading it right. If you're having those feelings like, because these stories turned the world upside down. They created revolutions over the last 2,000 years and continue to create revolutions today. And we were just so, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. We, re, we so domesticated and trivialized and, and um, accommodated these stories to, to our own expectations and normalities. When these stories, when people heard them, they reeled. How can that be? That makes no sense. That violates everything we know about rich people who put up gates to keep people like that away. Why would this rich person, and by the way, in your mind, you've always thought of this rich person negatively, how nasty he is. Here is a rich person who is allowing for a, not just a beggar, not just a, but a, a beggar who has an advanced case of leprosy. So how do you know it's advanced? Because the, the sores are oozing. It, it's, 
the pus and the, uh, and the leakage from his body is so severe that the dogs are licking his limbs. They say, well, wait a minute, how do you know he's there every day? You have guard dogs to keep people like this Lazarus guy away. You don't, you don't have dogs to, to accommodate them and to be friends with them. These are guard dogs. These are rapacious, uh, sna snappy, biting guard dogs. And here he had become friends with the guard dogs that are at the gate as sentries with the other people that are there to keep beggars and others away. So we don't know, that, we don't know but somehow this rich person, Di rich person, Dives, we're going to call it Dives, but it really means rich, rich person. This Dives character had said, leave him alone. Let him lie there. And was feeding him from his table. Now, wait a minute. What kind of a table does the richest person in the world have? Well, let's think about the Bill Gates table. I mean, you got, who's a chef? I mean, somebody like Rachel Ray. I mean, somebody, what's he eating? The, the best the food in the world. I'm somebody who likes leftovers. Can I, can I get a witness? I mean, I like to do, go spelunking. You know, it's like a... a uh, search and rescue mission in the refrigerator when you find these things that have been left over and then you heat them up and they're really better this like there I'm a leftover person I love sometimes the leftovers because you can play with them and mix them better than even the dish at the table that you got to be so formal about so he's getting the leftovers from the richest one of the richest people in the world's table whoa he's not getting crumbs he's getting and he it says he's longing meaning doesn't mean he didn't get it, but it means he's getting it and wants more. He just, every day he can't wait to get the the leftovers from Divey's table. Now let's just stop here for a second. Those of you who know the story have been brought up to have a negative view of this rich man. A a he, he's keeping all of his stuff to himself. He. So far, as Jesus has told it, this is the most positive portrayal of a rich person, arguably, in the New Testament. The way in which Jesus has told this story of a rich person who is allowed, can you, and besides that, he's got leprosy. It, it's a skin disorder that was so feared that if, and if you had leprosy, you had to have a bell and a, and a note, stay away, stay away. And when somebody did come too close, it was your job to ring the bell so they would stay away. The holiest code of Jesus' day was based on well, how holy were you? How, how well did you keep yourself from uncleanliness? And one of the worst uncleanlinesses was leprosy. So he had to flout all sorts of rich person's convention and religious convention. Can you imagine who do the rich people, who visits the homes of the rich people? Are there rich people? And politicians, by the way. Um, politicians go don't go to the homes of rich people. Rich people go to, the, I mean, politicians uh, go to the homes of rich people. Rich people don't go to politicians. Politicians go to rich people. So he's, he's got, he's got this parade of, of the, the powers of, and the and the movers and shakers of his day coming through his gate, having to deal with, you know how gross it is to see dogs lick pus off a leper? And, and besides, he's, he's diseased, and so they got to risk getting unclean themselves, even get, going through that gate. And you can imagine the, the feedback, the pushback, the, the negative. What in the world are you doing, Dives, with that beggar at your gate? How gross is that? Do you know how it is coming into your house here, having to go through and see all that? This is, you were reading this and going, this is, how can this be? How, what, what is going on here? And this is the, this is the, the clunker right now that comes. It comes quick in the story. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Right now, that's kind of surprising because the reigning theology of Jesus' day was wealth was a sign of, of your approval, of God's approval of you. Poverty, beggardom was a sign of your suffering from the sins of your past and your ancestors. And basically, there's no hope for you. So the 
Lazarus, the, the beggar, the rich, the poor guy, is in heaven. Wait a minute, here's the clunker. And the rich man also died and was buried in hell. Okay. Wait a minute. Dives is where? In hell. Who did more to help the poor and the outcast than anybody in his culture? And he's where? In hell. Why is Dives in hell? And this is the whole point of the story. This is the whole uh, kind of momentum of the story is solving this problem of it's easier for us today to understand why uh, Lazarus would be in heaven, although that was a problem for Jesus' day. But for us, and for Jesus' day, this whole issue of Dives, the rich person, with all of his good deeds and all of his outreach and protection of those that were marginalized and, and the outcast, and why is he in hell? I mean, he, he's got on his doorstep the leper, the literal leper of his day. He's taking in the homeless and the diseased and the, the mentally. He, he's got him here on his doorstep. How many homeless you got living at your front porch or on your doorstep or on your front yard? And he ends up with doing all that. He ends up where? He's still in, he ends up in hell. In hell. Where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Okay, now you get a little indication why Dives may be in hell. Because how is he treating a Lazarus? as a servant, as somebody who would do his beck and be at his beck and call. Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Aunt Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go down here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Now, what seems obvious from the story is that people in hell can see heaven, but heaven can't see hell because it's Abraham that has to take the message. He's not talking to Lazarus directly. He's talking to Abraham. Then Dives answered, I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house. In other words, if he can't come to see me, please send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Now, at this point in the story, people would have chuckled, okay? Because Caiaphas, the high priest, had five brothers. So that would have been, now I don't know whether Jesus is wanting people at this point to think of uh, the main character is Caiaphas, the high priest, or just he does like to get in little digs and, and little little slings at times. And so this could have been just a little, but wait a minute, but there is the importance of this detail. Five brothers. Okay. This rich person has five brothers. Whether it's Jesus meaning Caiaphas, it's part of it. I think it was, but the point is he's got five brothers. The five is named. And actual numericals, numbers, are metaphorical. They have meaning. So, we're, so we got to say, we don't know why. Why did Jesus mention that five brother thing? It could be a dig, but it's more than that. Because it's always more than that with Jesus. We don't know. We've got to suspend it. So we got to suspend here that Jesus is the only character he names. He names us after his best friend. He's, he's also got five brothers here. We don't know what that relates to. Unless it is this dig at Caiaphas. But um, let him warn them 
my five brothers, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, they have, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Wow. That's the part of the story Charles Dickens didn't like. What if he could have come back? What if Dives could have come back from hell and told and warned his family and others and changed his life in front of them? What if he could have come? Hence the Christmas story. Um, Ebenezer, by the way, is also a, um, a derivative of the, the word, the name Lazarus, but that's a whole other um, a whole other, other conversation. So we have to come to this quick point of no return. Why is Dives in hell? When he did more than we are doing, than we could do. And what is Jesus trying to convey to us today? in all the good works that he's doing to, to help the poor and to give them food and to take care of them, and yet he ends up still in hell. Why is Dives in hell? Are you ready? Because Dives said, I have five brothers. And the truth is, he actually had six. God had given him a sixth brother, one to treat like a brother, one to be a brother. Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it to me. And he hasn't done anything himself. He's just been farming it out and passing it out to others. And Jesus, no, no, no. You treat him like a brother, which means he belongs where? Not in front of your gate. Not at a distance. He belongs where? At the table with you. You bring to the table. Gee, this is all about the table again. The hospitality of the table. The importance of sitting at the table, giving them the best seats, the poor, and the abandoned, and the diseased. You bring them to the table. This is my table. Your table becomes my table. And we put as places of honor these people at our table. And you treat them like a brother. He really had six brothers. God had given him six. And he did remember, there's a new family with Jesus. Not just the patriarchal, um, dynastic family. It's the new family. And God had given Dives a sixth brother. And he kept him at arm's length. And the promise is, not just that you treat him like a brother, but around that table, that least and last can become what? Your best friend. He, the boar. I love to talk to Salvation Army. They have all sorts of stories about the rich love to be seen at Thanksgiving and Easter. And they're there ladling out food to the poor. But the hardest thing to get the rich to do is to enter into a relationship with the poor. Not just to show up at these times, especially when the cameras are there, to be seen ladling out the food. And again, it's still arm's length. But to bring them to your table to make him a part of your life, to be in relationship one. Do you know a Lazarus? Is there a Lazarus in your life? And these are some harsh words that come as even this rich person and all that he did that violated and flouted all the conventions. He was pushing the edges for his day, and it still wasn't enough because Jesus has a higher standard. It's a relationship standard. Are you in relationship with these people? Do you know these people? Are they part of this new family that I'm creating? 
are some of them even becoming like my Lazarus, your best friend. A semiotic reading of the story behind the Charles Dickens Christmas story. <laughs>